Hi. What I have here on the bench today is an Emerald PPS 35-2 programmable power supply. It is a single channel 35 volts, 2 amps power supply. And as you can see in the back, I have another Emerald programmable power supply in the lab. And that one is a PPS 2322 and has a dual channel configuration. I did a quick teardown and some modification for a temperature controlled fan circuitry quite a few years ago on that power supply. And I will provide the link down below if you want to check that out. Anyway, I have quite a few power supplies in the lab already. So why am I getting another one? Well, first of all, you can never have too many power supplies. You typically need quite a few independent power rails when troubleshooting a medium complexity circuit, especially when you are trying to rule out any power supply issues. You will definitely need some high quality lab power supplies for substitution. And my advice to hobbyists is that instead of buying some cheap, no brand power supplies with unknown characteristics, you can find a really high quality lab power supply like this one on eBay for just about the same price if you are willing to look around. The main reason this power supply is attractive is that it has a front panel sensing terminals. And this is great for testing relatively high power consumption circuits that are dynamic in nature. If the sense lines are used, we can guarantee that the voltage at the load, load side does not change if the load varies. Interesting enough, this one is only a single channel power supply and the maximum output power is only at 70 watts when the output voltage is 35 volts and the current is at 2 amps. But nevertheless, it's quite heavy. In fact, it feels like it is about the same weight as the uh, dual channel one uh, back there. And that one has two channels with each channel capable of delivering 70 watts each. So it would be curious to compare the inside to the PPS 2322 back there when I open it up later. But before I do that, I wanted to just do a few quick tests. And the first thing I wanted to test is uh, just to verify that uh, the power supply is indeed operating correctly as I have not load tested this power supply after I bought it. And for that, I'm using this uh, Array Electronics 3711A uh, electronic load. Out of the factory, these Emerald power supplies are typically configured as local sensing, meaning that their sensing terminals are actually connected to their power supply outputs from the rear terminal. So now let's uh, power it on and take a look. And you probably heard that silly sound. That's actually the beeper. And I don't really like these emeralds sound. So I usually just turn them off. Uh, so for that, I think I can turn it uh, off like that. So let me try again. So now I turn it back on. Yeah, it should not have any keypad sound. And uh, at the moment, we're outputting zero volts and actually the output is off. But you can see that over voltage protection is blinking. And so I'm not going to go to the details at how these power supplies operate. But uh, this Emerald power supply, uh, similar to the one I had behind there, is they, they have a voltage. Uh, you can set the output voltage and set a current limit and also can have over voltage and over voltage protection. So let's, uh, for the time being, ignore that. So let me turn off the over voltage and also over current. And now I'm going to set output to uh, the maximum vol voltage, let's say 35 volts. That's what this power supply is good uh, for. So it's 35 volts. And let's set the output current to two amps. So right now it is indeed two amps. So now we can actually turn the output on. Of course, after we turn the output on, uh, because remember, we have the sensing terminal tied at the uh, uh, rear panel, so that's okay. But in general, you shouldn't be leaving these uh, uh, sensing terminals floating. And of course, you can hear the fan of this uh, Emerald power supply is rather noisy. That's why I 
uh, pretty much changed all my power supplies to make the fan temp temperature sensitive, but I will save that modification till some later time. Anyway, so right now we can turn on the electronic load and we will connect the power supply to the electronic load. So right now I'm using this uh, Kelvin sensing uh, clip. The reason for that is later on we're going to be testing the sensing terminal. So right now I'm going to only use one uh, lead here. So this is a positive and it will connect to positive. And for the negative, we're going to again use only one lead and connect to negative. Now, of course, uh, you can see that we are sensing uh, the voltage at the terminal here. Oh, sorry, it's a little bit hard to get clipped on here. Okay, so now we're clipped on. You can see that we're sensing uh, 35.08 uh, volts, and that's just a reading from this electronic load. So right now, let me turn on the load. And we wanted to uh, gradually increase the current draw so that we will hopefully see that the voltage at the terminal here it drops because of the length of the cable here so let's uh, start doing that and you can already see that we're dropping so i can uh, increase the current till we hit roughly uh, two amps that's the maximum that the power supply is capable of so before it goes into the current limit mode i think i can go to two amps so now you can see we have this discrepancy of roughly 0.2 volts. And just make sure that we are, uh, because these two meters are not calibrated. So let's use a one meter to do the measurement here. So I have my BK precision meter here. So I'm going to put it up here. You can see what the reading is. And um, on at the power output here, so the power supply output is 34.99 is indeed as what is set here but at the load side right now we're seeing is 34.77 uh, so a little bit higher than what is reported by that load but nevertheless we have roughly 0.2 volts voltage drop so now you have seen the baseline let me disconnect these uh, leads and I'm going to turn off both the power supply and the load and I'm going to also uh, temporarily disable the link between the sensing terminal and uh, power supply output at the rear end and we will do four terminal measurement again. And now I have removed these metal straps from the rear terminal and so now the power supply is hooked up to the load via these remote sensing wires and the Kelvin clips on the electronic load side. And I probably want to set the output voltage a little bit lower. Let's try 30 volts. The reason for that is because when we're drawing current on these wires and in order trying to compensate for the voltage drop, the source would try to uh, raise the voltage. But since the maximum voltage output is 35 volts, so it can't go anywhere. So I suspect it's going to go into a protection mode or something like that. But anyway, so now we set it to 30 volts and it's uh, oscillating a little bit. And I suspect the reason is that we are not drawing any current yet. So let's uh, start drawing some current on our load. And uh, you can see uh, the output voltage at the terminal at the load side remains at the 30.07 and it really hasn't changed so that's a good sign and let's just crank it all the way up to 2 amps and we'll see what the voltage re uh, readings are so now we're approaching 2 amps and uh, we should be able to uh, no not 2 amps because that's the just at the borderline. So let's uh, go to 1.95. As you have observed, the output voltage at the load side remains 30.06 volts as measured by this electronic load. Uh, it doesn't really matter how high the current we crank it up to be. So that's the beauty of this remote sensing. So now I have showed you the uh, capability of this power supply and uh, let me power off and uh, I will open it up and take a look inside.
And now I open up the case, you can see the inside of this unit. And as I suspected before, this inside looks almost identical to that found in my other dual channel power supply, which is the uh, Emerald 2322. And uh, even the toroidal uh, transformer, the size look identical. And of course, this one does have one less winding, so it's probably not as bulky. But nevertheless, they're using the same size toroidal transformer and uh, pretty much the same boards layout as well. And another thing is that uh, this heatsink is probably going to be a little bit smaller. And I'm going to uh, pop up a uh, photo on this video to show you what is, uh, the other board looks like. And, uh, but just judging from my memory, the only thing that I can see that is not on this board is a riser board. That riser board is the auxiliary power supply. And you can see that here, that portion is actually uh, on this main board right here. And if memory served me correctly, this main board down here does look a little bit of smaller. In fact, it's about maybe a couple of inches uh, shorter than the main board on that dual channel 2322 back there. And now let me remove that uh, riser controller board back there and we'll take a closer look here. And now I took the digital controller riser board out of the unit so you can take a closer look. And uh, this uh, board actually uh, looks identical to the controller board that we found in the 2322 dual channel version. So which means that uh, really uh, they just programmed it differently. And then for the dual channel version, they just populated the uh, additional header here. And for single channel, simply just populate one header. So interestingly, uh, all the circuitry here are exactly the same for the dual channel and the single channel. And uh, we can see a, a programmable uh, logic array here. And uh, there are a couple of uh, SRAM and uh, memory for the EEPROM right here. And then we have our microprocessor, which is a, a 6031 here. And uh, up here, we have this National Instrument GPIB controller and a couple of, uh, well, quite a few of these opto isolators to transfer the signal back to uh, control the other portion of the circuitry. Now this board is not as clean as the board that we saw in the uh, dual channel version. As you can see a couple of uh, botched uh, on capacitors here and also on the backside. And I think you can see that we do have some components that are also later botched on. But uh, uh, besides that, these, uh, and also of course there is a uh, a wire that was soldered directly from the looks like the front panel here and onto this board. Not entirely sure why this is done this way, but uh, nevertheless, the board itself looks exactly the same. And by the way, I will also dump the EEPROM content and post it onto my website for those who are interested. And also from the data codes on various chips, we can see that this unit it was manufactured roughly the same time as the other Emerald uh, unit and roughly at some time in 1996. If you recall in that 2322 teardown video, we saw that there were three chips here, but uh, the markings were sent off. And uh, in this unit, the 32-2, and we can see we also have these three chips, but the markings are there. So we can take a look at what those chips are and to see if there's anything special. So the first two chips up here, not sure if you can see the marking from this angle, but they are TC4015. And uh, these are dual four stage uh, shifter chips. So nothing special about these two. And uh, this one, right here is an analog devices AD7541, which is a 12-bit uh, DAC. So, I mean, this is really nothing special either. And of course, we can deduce the uh, DAC used in this unit by the voltage resolution, output resolution, and current resolution this unit has. So we kind of already know it has a 
12-bit DAC, but now we know the exact DAC they were using is an AD7541. And uh, beyond that, everything else is pretty much the same as we, we have already seen in the other Emerald unit. And interestingly, we do have this uh, botched wire with two resistors going all the way back to near the other sensing resistor back there. By the look of it, this might just be a differential input pair uh, doing some kind of sensing. Uh, that's just my guess because we have a we do have a uh, uh, op amp right here. And again, as I mentioned earlier, that we do see a little bit more botch in this version, the single channel version versus the dual channel version. So I'm not sure if it is because of the version of the boards or earlier or what, or what, but you can see that even in the power entry unit, we, uh, instead of a very clean board uh, laid out, we do have these capacitors uh, just, uh, you know, botched onto the power entry module here. And uh, that's pretty much what's inside this unit. And if you look at it here, we do have a connector coming out from the transformer, but that connector is not connected anywhere on this uh, single channel uh, power supply unit. So not entirely sure what that uh, connector is for. By the way, if you look at the back of the unit, you will see what I meant earlier. You will see that uh, the sensing terminal is actually strapped onto the uh, power output so that by default, it is uh, not using the remote sensing, but rather local sensing. And also you can see the GPIP port back here. And uh, because this unit also supports remote sensing, you can see that in the front panel here, and it might be, may not be too clear this picture, but uh, you can see those uh, ferret beads on each of the terminals. That's very important as any noise picked up by the sensing terminal would affect your uh, voltage regulation in, and also the stability of the power supply. And that's pretty much all I wanted to cover for this teardown of this uh, Emerald 35 2 programmable power supply. And I, of course, I'm going to put everything back together, but uh, I won't bore you with the detail there. I hope you liked the video and learned something new. If you liked the video, please give it a big thumbs up. Remember to subscribe, share, and I will catch up with you next time.